Welcome to Assembly Calendar. I'm Mike Friesan, and with us for our program today, Assemblyman Andrew Goodell. Assemblyman Goodell represents the 150th Assembly District and in New York State, the 150th District includes all of Chautauqua County. We want to thank you folks in Chautauqua County and all across Western New York for joining us for our program today. Assemblyman Goodell, nice to see you. Great Happy 2013. Again. Yes, it's amazing. It is. Uh, time uh, just uh, flies right by, even here at the State Capitol with all the strange <laughs> things that happen here. Uh, time tends to go very, very quickly. Let's talk about that. Beginning of a legislative session, a little bit atypical, this 2013 uh, yeah. session, uh, the way it began. We, we, uh, we've got the usual debates underway. We're going to talk a little bit about the budget and things getting started. But we had a major piece of legislation make its way through the system already, pushed from the governor's office through the legislature and into law. And I'm, I'm talking about that uh, gun control legislation. Yes, and uh, the, the whole process was very frustrating to anyone who's interested in good government. As you know, the state constitution requires three days notice of any legislation with an exception. And the exception is if the governor issues a statement of necessity or a message of necessity. The message of necessity was designed to handle emergency situations. And there was no emergency situation dealing with this legislation. The three-day constitutional requirement is designed to enable us to reach out to our constituents, to get their input, their advice, their counsel, to research the ramifications of the bill, to make sure it's properly drafted, and to uh, make sure that the legislative process is careful and deliberate. Well, the governor really just ran this legislation through, gave a statement of necessity that didn't mention any emergency, and the only real emergency was a political emergency to help the governor uh, show some national leadership because he was in a race to beat Obama uh, to have the first gun control legislation out there before President Obama could even issue a report. And that was the emergency. And the, and the bill, because it was jammed through, is just full of mistakes. For example, the bill makes it illegal for police officers to fully load their own weapons. I mean, that's crazy. Um, it has a provision that makes it a crime if your gun is stolen and you don't report it. This is the only law that I'm aware of where we arrest the victim. I mean, that's amazing. One section of the law makes it a Class E felony for you not to register your gun. A different section says it's a Class A misdemeanor. You know, the same event. Which is it? A Class A? A Class E? And, you know, that is just the tip of the iceberg. You can understand the, uh, I'll say, I'll use the word politics. You can understand the sentiment behind this kind of legislation after the very mm -hmm. dramatic event, uh, events of Newtown, Connecticut, the shooting there, and what happened in Colorado and such, of people wanting to figure something out, trying to yeah. keep those sorts of events from happening. And in fact, let's take a look and a listen to some of what was said by the governor as he proposed this legislation, and then a little bit as it made its way through the legislative process. Uh, some of the things that were said by members of the legislature. And then we'll come back and we'll talk about what can be done and how effective or ineffective this piece of legislation will be. We need a gun policy in this state that is reasonable, that is balanced, that is measured. We respect hunters and sportsmen. This is not taking away people's guns. I own a gun. I own a Remington shotgun. I've hunted. I've shot. That's not what this is about. It is about ending the unnecessary risk of high-capacity assault rifles. That's what this is about. A bill of this significance of, and consequence to the residents of New York State, and especially dealing with the Second Amendment rights uh, granted to us through the United States Constitution, is too important of a bill to be rushing through the legislative process. All of the stakeholders have not had an opportunity to weigh in on this legislation and whether it really keeps our communities and families safe. As you know, and all my colleagues know, we've banned assault weapons, and they've been banned in New York State since 1994, almost 20 years ago. And this bill, while it increases the definition and adds more restrictions on the definition of assault bans, doesn't remove any assault ban or any weapons, any guns that are out there now. Every gun that is out there today, that's lawful today, will be lawful tomorrow. That's what this bill does. Nothing. 
It doesn't take any of those guns away. It doesn't take them out of circulation. So what does this bill do? What it does is requires about a million rifle owners, about a million of them, to register their rifle. And if they don't, they're subject to a Class E felony. And every five years, they have to renew that registration. And if they don't, it's a Class A misdemeanor. So we take a million people who today lawfully own a gun, and we require them to go through this registration process so they become a felon. That's an interesting way to look at this. A lot of people were complaining and complaining about all the things this bill would do, but you're standing there saying it really doesn't do anything. Well, that's the most frustrating thing. It was all political theater. Um, we're all concerned about gun violence, of course. We're all appalled by what happened at Sandy Hook and at Webster. The problem with this legislation, it doesn't address any of that. And during a floor debate, I asked the sponsor, if this legislation were in effect, would it have stopped? What happened in Sandy Hook with the massacre of those innocent young children? The answer was no. I said, well, would it have protected our first responders who showed up at Webster? And the answer to that was no. So it didn't remove any rifles from circulation. Uh, all it did is require that those rifles be registered. And you have a year to register them. And I can guarantee you, those rifles are flowing across the border like crazy even as we talk because there's a year before you can track where they, who owns them. It, the rifles themselves, while they look dangerous, the data is overwhelming that very, very few murders in New York State are actually caused with a rifle. There were only five murders in 2011 with any rifle, five. Um, with over a million of these rifles out there, it's statistically safer than, than uh, well, by cars or, or bicycles even. There are a lot more people killed by bicycles. 55 people were killed by subways. Very, very few people are killed with rifles. Handguns uh, account for a much larger percentage of murders, but this bill doesn't deal with handguns. I mean, very, very few handguns would be affected by this. And so what it was is it was all political theater to make it look like New York was leading the nation in gun control, when in reality we weren't addressing the tough and the difficult issues, which deals with people who have mental health issues. And um, during the floor debate it became clear that when you analyze the people who committed these mass murders, almost all of them had psychological problems. Many of them were taking psychotropic drugs or were on antidepressants or uh, many of them had a long history of mental health illness. Yet New York is not moving strongly to help those patients with more effective treatment. We're actually moving in the opposite direction. We're under tremendous pressure from the federal government to get people out of halfway houses and shut down the halfway houses and mainstream those with mental health issues without the type of structure and the supervision that they need. In a mental health halfway house, you have a trained concert that's making sure the patients are getting their medications, that's monitoring their conditions, and making sure that they're doing as best they can possibly do. Yet there are some people that are concerned that we stigmatize people with mental health by requiring them to be in a halfway house. It's the opposite. We're not stigmatizing anybody, anybody by helping them be the most successful they can, by making sure that they're safe to themselves and to society, to make sure that they get the mental health treatment they need. That's not a stigmatization. That's helping them succeed. This bill doesn't deal with any of those issues, and the state is moving in the opposite direction. So it gives a false sense of security. It puts our law enforcement officials at a disadvantage by making their own weapons illegal if they, if they load them fully. It forces a million people to register the guns, even though statistically those guns aren't used in murders. It imposes huge costs all across the state, and it doesn't address the real crisis that was occurring and is, and is occurring. Yeah, a lot of people uh, sat around after what happened in Connecticut, after what happened in Webster, you know, they're sitting around their home talking uh, over dinner, uh, they're at their office talking around the water cooler or whatever it may yeah. be, trying to figure it out. I mean, what's the answer to this sort of thing going to be? And uh, 
it was interesting to hear that debate on the assembly floor because of all those questions that you and, and your colleagues asked of the bill sponsor, uh, in, a, in an effect, the governor who drafted and supported this legislation, who ended up saying, as you noted, well, no, this actually wouldn't, wouldn't do anything. Wouldn't have touched any of that. Yeah, and the, and the problem when you have legislation what like do you that, do? that's jammed through the legislature. I got the bill on around midnight the day before. And, um, oh, sure, I, I read it. I mean, you know, I, as an attorney, I, I, I mean, that's my skill set, you know. Um, but it was, I mean, that's not the way to do business, obviously. And the real problem is that uh, there are some people that think we've now solved the problem. And the problem is much more difficult to solve than simply requiring someone who's always owned a rifle to register that rifle. You and I were having a conversation about a, a different issue, but it seems like there's a real parallel between the gun control bill that we're, we've been talking about and that other issue, which is minimum wage. Yeah. There's a problem. People want to solve it. You want to take that segment of the community that's making lower wages and give them a step up. So a lot of people say, well, an increase in the minimum wage is the way to do that seems to make sense. But your argument, uh, and I remember some of this from last year's mm -hmm. debate on the subject, is, is that's not necessarily that we've got to look at the bigger issue. We need, some we need some deeper thinking, I guess, is what you've been and saying. And longer term thinking. Um, absolutely. Um, you know, when the federal government raises a minimum wage, it doesn't change the competitive nature of New York State versus other states. But when New York raises its minimum wage, and the proposal that we have is a 20% increase in minimum wage, which would make us the highest of any of our neighboring states. When that happens, New York sheds jobs to the neighboring states. And the empirical research backs it up. When New York last did this unilaterally, a group out of Cornell, uh, economists, very highly respected, analyzed the impact of the increase in minimum wage on employment. And what they found is that when we increased the minimum wage, the working poor suffered the most in terms of a reduction in the number of jobs and in the number of hours of work. And uh, what they, they projected that an increase in the minimum wage to $8.25 would result in over 29,000 people losing their jobs. We don't need less jobs in New York. We need more jobs. And we need more jobs at the entry level as well. We need to have jobs where employers can afford to hire someone who has never worked before and provide them the job skills and the job training so that they can move up. You know, minimum wage jobs should not be a, a career goal or objective. It should be a stepping stone to a more successful and more profitable occupation. But when you raise the price of minimum wage, employers can't afford to provide the job training, and you increase competition for those, for those jobs. Um, and so you end up with fewer of those jobs because employers can't afford it. You end up with higher competition for the few jobs that are remaining. And who are the losers? The low-skill, entry-level workers. I mean, the empirical data is just overwhelming. And so, you know, as you know, I'm the ranker on social services. I want to help people get ahead. I want to help people get out of poverty. I want to help people get off welfare. you got to help people by giving them job opportunities. And if you price them out of the market, you trap them permanently in welfare. And that is the antithesis of what we want to be doing. You used a phrase earlier called political theater. And I think sometimes that's the problem, is that there's so much political theater that that deeper thinking on the issues to come up with real solutions is sometimes left behind. And we see that all too often here in Albany. Yes. That's going to have to be it for us. We want to thank Assemblyman Andy Goodell for joining us for our program today. Assemblyman, thank you for being here. Thank you folks too. And we'll hope to see you all soon for our next edition of Assembly Calendar.